Natasha Sarkis. This is Mary Ann Chapo, and I'm the editor of Cafe de Census, an online magazine. We are here in conversation with Nandita Das, internationally acclaimed actor, director, and social worker, who's here in New York City to speak at various events. Thank you very much. Thank you. You were actively involved in social work way before, as you put elsewhere, accidentally tumbled into acting. But in the roles that you've selected during your acting career, they're very intentional in reflecting your in, uh, fight against intolerance and social evils of various kinds. So what are some of the implications of being a socially conscious actor in a country like India? Well, I mean, these are things you not only consciously do, but kind of instinctively do. You know, the experiences you have in your life, they do impact your choices going forward. Um, and in fact, a lot of the times in India also they think that because you are an actor and you know, you're using your sort of persona or the public space to be able to do something or talk about social issues. And actually, like you rightly said, it is it was the other way around. So this is not too common. So I don't know what really the implications are. But I think um, it, it at least has helped me to marry these two interests or these two fields that may seemingly be very different streams of work. One is very public space, and one at some level is very personal and very private. But um, I used to do much more grassroots level work earlier. And then when I got into acting, it started giving me a platform to talk about various issues. And I would kind of put on my actor's hat and then remove it and start talking about things that I was truly passionate about. So um, I feel fortunate that I have these opportunities to you know, sort of engage with various kinds of people. So here I might be talking to like I spoke at the World Bank or I spoke at a university in Brown or whatever. I mean, there is a certain kind of crowd. Back home, I also do a lot of grassroots level interventions or advocacy work for people who are really on the ground doing amazing work. But it's just that the larger world doesn't seem to know about it. And then you see increasingly your role as a catalyst towards you know, bringing their stories to the fore. But in the roles that you have portrayed, those are roles that have dire consequences and a daily confrontation with fear for the people who actually live those experiences in their everyday life, like the married woman who is in a homosexual relationship in fire, then uh, the AIDS-afflicted young woman in a colored Mawson, and then there is the rural lower caste woman who's fighting child marriage in Bhavandar. So what role has the emotion of fear played in your own life, in your journey and towards becoming a rebel with a cause? Well, I think again, it's sort of at a very subconscious level. You know, you, all these roles are not just roles, they're experiences. For instance, in Bhavanda, for example, you know, I was in Rajasthan, I was in a small village, I was shooting there, you're interacting with the local people. Um, I think the real, like when you're shooting, it's at some level very technical also, in the sense that you don't, uh, you know, you, you don't get emotionally affected at that point, but what starts impacting you? is the whole experience of working in those spaces and after that when you interact with people, when you show a film and people tell you their stories and through that your growth also as a human being starts happening. You know, sort of at a subconscious level you start becoming more sensitive. For instance, when I did fire, I had understood the issue of homosexuality at a more intellectual level. You know, it was a journey for me also. It was a, I didn't quite understand it at an emotional level that what people go through when there is so much of stigma, what kind of a hypocritical double standards we have in our society, how insensitive a society can be at large. So I think for me also it was a journey because a lot of people started, a lot of especially lesbians who came would come and talk to me and tell me their stories and you know, without realizing I started championing the cause, not that I started off being all of that, I just thought it was an interesting story. It, talked about issues that even in my liberal family we didn't talk enough about. But I, I know from 96 to now, I'm, you know, my own understanding of what we think is the other, what is the fear of the unknown, you know, how important it is to be sort of, um, you know, compassionate as a human being or not to judge people or, or to think whatever is different from you is not wrong or, you know, some various other questions that we grapple with starts getting impacted by those experiences and uh, yeah so I think at an emotional level at a spiritual level you know it's, there is a kind of a growth it's not just professional or it's not just intellectual it all kind of happens simultaneously and it's sometimes only in these interviews 
that you also get a chance to kind of maybe reflect and tangibly kind of articulate them. But uh, you you see your you see your growth in the way you respond to situations. Now uh, in India, you are the ambassador of the Dark is Beautiful campaign. And uh, in whenever you have spoken about that campaign, you rightfully focus on India's obsession with fairness. And so, ha have you ever felt that the campaign slogan "Dark is Beautiful" can can in a way come across as defensive and perpetuate comments like "Oh, you're dark, but you're still so pretty," rather than enabling us to, you know, like a very uh, tangibly fight against this obsession with fair skin and I'm top and I have in mind the efforts to uh, ban fair and lovely or the vaginal bleaching cream and things like that. Uh, this campaign I believe was going on since 2009. They contacted me last year sometime in May, an organization called Women of Worth and this lady called Kavita Emanuel, she contacted me and she said, you know, would you give your photograph and a quote for it? And I support a lot of other issues that I may not directly be connected to. And for me, it was never a full-blown issue, I have to admit, that, you know, I didn't really give it that kind of a center state. Of course, when you're talking about self-esteem or, you know, or even if you're talking about something completely different, like you're talking about environment or communalism or sectarian violence or whatever, and sometimes a girl would get up and say, ma'am, how come you're so confident despite being dark? So, of course, I was aware that it was a huge issue. And I mean, I was fortunate that my my parents didn't put that complex in me. But um, I didn't know how big it was till it really got viral and I realized that it had touched a very, very raw nerve and, you know, across class, countries, and a lot of, suddenly there was a lot of media attention on it. And I was initially thinking, my God, here we are talking about women and violence, and we are talking about female infanticide, and dowry death, which seemed much larger. But what this did was to really talk about your basic self-esteem. Talking about being defensive, maybe I wouldn't have named it dark is beautiful, I would have just say be yourself, you know, whoever you are, and sort of broadened it. But this was, a, this was already a campaign, and I think it came from also, you know, often, often these kind of rebellious things do come as a reaction to something. It's like because fairness has been equated with beauty, it has been kind of standardized, beauty has been standardized into a definition that it to be this tall and this thin and this fair and all of that. And so I think it was, a, it was kind of a reactive statement to say dark is also beautiful or dark is beautiful or I don't know, whichever way. So yes, there is a kind of a defensiveness and maybe not the ideal situation, but at least it's making people think. It's like when in fire, when two sister-in-laws you know, fall in love and uh, some of my friends were saying that why do you, why do two women have to have bad marriages to get into a relationship? They don't need to. But I think it was a good entry into a society which otherwise is so close-minded to something like this that it kind of gave them a sense of, well, yes, if there is a bad marriage, at least <laughs> it's kind of a gentler, smoother entry and then you can go into stronger, bolder statements. So in some sense, maybe it was a gentler entry into saying the dark is beautiful. Then. And uh, yeah, and I've also suffered it over the years, if not from my parents, but you know, from other people saying, making comments, you get into a shop and they want to give you anti-tan cream, which is kind of a euphemism for basically making you white. Or, you know, your makeup person tells you before a shoot that I'll make you white. You must have uh, heard all of this, me saying that. So, I think in a country like India or South Asia or even other countries, I've got you know, emails and calls from Brazil and from, you know, countries in Africa and all of that. It is an obsession and I think the fight to just to fight against one particular cream is not going to really help till the mindset doesn't change, till the prejudice doesn't change. Because these products are only cashing on only existing prejudice. So, uh, but they have filed a petition against one of the creams and one of the celebrities. But you know, beyond the point, it's your own consciousness and your own uh, you know, response, sense of responsibility. And if people don't, then at least you hope that there will be less and less demand for something like this. And by the way, there was a recent survey where they actually said that the, um, the, the whitening products have gone down, like tangibly. So I guess it is having some, yeah, because a lot of people are talking. I mean, I, every second place that I go to, they now want to engage in that and say, oh, it's very comforting. There's a kind of a validation. You know, I was thinking, but I wasn't sure if I was thinking right. 
met young girls who said I wanted to commit suicide because I wasn't being able to be fair. So you know, I think yeah, I think it's a worthwhile campaign, and I, I don't want to be too much of a cynic. And so, uh, your your life, your courage, and your principles is a huge inspiration for many of us. So, who are some of the people that inspired you in your own journey? Oh, many, many, many people, many women, and they're not all necessarily known people, but. Uh, Fabulous women who have just quietly, without all the media glare and all this, have just done what they believed in. What I deeply admire is a deep sense of conviction and to have that courage to follow through that conviction. Because often people begin with a lot of conviction and along the line they kind of lose it. So there are many such people. Um, in fact, there's a Malayali, uh, Mercy Matthew, who is a great inspiration. She's called Daya Bai. She works, she's been working for over 30 years in Madhya Pradesh with uh, tribals primarily and um, on land rights, on issues of girl child and almost single handedly. So uh, she's quite incredible and she's a one woman army. And uh, so there are various people. There's a lovely uh, storyteller called Indira Mukherjee who just goes around telling stories to little children. So whether it's in the northeast, whether it's to the village children, whether it's to the government schools and teaches young teachers to just tell stories. I mean, you know, these are very different. They don't think of their work as a career. You know, if you ask me what's my career or my profession, I wouldn't be able to answer because I don't see them as professions. That's your life here. It's so deeply integrated with, you know, what you believe in and your work and for me there's still interests, whether it's acting or direction or engaging in these kind of issues. But for them it's completely their life. And and there are many such people who have been so fortunate that they continue to inspire me and I, I come fully charged and you know it also sort of keeps you firmly on the ground and uh, you realize that you're just trying to do your little bit and your little drop and uh, they are big drops I mean everybody's a drop I think <laughs> so we can't take ourselves too seriously but uh, definitely when you see these big drops then you feel really inspired. Finally, what are some of your upcoming projects that your hardcore fans like us should look out for? Well, uh, if there are any hardcore fans, yes, I'm sure yeah. they keep getting disappointed because I don't do that many films. <laughs> I've been doing a play actually called Between the Lines, okay. and it uh, deals with the you know the subtle inequalities that exist in marriages, in couples, of working people. So when the woman's also working and the man's working, and you're educated and you're affluent you're still grappling with those subtle inequalities that are so inherent in a patriarchal system and despite our 21st century and all of that, that gap has remained. So we've been, uh, I wrote it, I directed it, I acted, I made my husband act in it. So we've been traveling with it and it's been interesting to see the response because it resonates with the most couples. Um, so I just finished a Spanish film which was shot in Mumbai and Barcelona. So I did that, so hopefully that's it's called yes. Traces at the moment and it's an all women crew. Mm -hmm. So which was quite interesting, not just gimmicky but it's quite interesting to actually see how you know the, the dynamics are very different when all, all the women are working. I think it's definitely a greater sense of empathy mm -hmm. on the set. And um, yeah, so of course my advocacy work continuing. I'm reading a lot of scripts but nothing that's true so sort of exciting. So, um, with that, we come to an end of this brief conversation. We'd like to once again thank Nandita Das for giving us an interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.